So I'm not sure if that's what they mean, these unintended convergences, these incidental meshes of, of detail it is predicated on studiously ignoring design of each gospel and redactional patterns of changes from one to the other. Malcolm and these others just don't care about that and, and reject all of that as coincidence because this stuff is, is written there simply because eyewitnesses said it and they're not going to reject any of it. And that, that just seems to me like a kind of, I just want to go back uh, to what they told me in Sunday school. Welcome to The Historical Tell. This is episode four. In episode three, we picked up on the third and fourth of Luke's tells, how Semitism's cluster around eyewitness material and how various features of Luke's writing converge with historical data. In this episode, we're discussing the fifth and final tell, that Luke includes eyewitness material from John. In the opening clip of this episode, we saw Robert Price critiquing the use of unintentional patterns to demonstrate reliance on eyewitnesses. In that clip, Price also refers to an article by Theodore Whedon, in which Whedon endorses the claim that, quote, generic indicators of factualness could easily be mimicked or subverted by writers of the first and second centuries, end quote. We could use like a criminal case as an illustration. You might have a suspect. For that suspect, you have motive and opportunity. Well, those two factors work together, they're cumulative, toward the suspect's potential guilt. But neither increases the probative strength of the other. And now take another example, where you have several eyewitness accounts to a particular crime. And not only do they all name the suspect as the guilty party, but in small incidental details, they in fact corroborate one another's accounts. Not only do they increase the likelihood of the suspect's guilt, at the same time they increase the reliability of one another's accounts by corroborating these incidental details. This is why the, the notion of a tell is important, because they serve as independent, unintentional features of Luke's text. And these then corroborate the overall case for Luke's reliance on eyewitnesses. So for example, the first tell, if I argue that the naming patterns are indicative of eyewitness sources. Well, on one level that's true, but on another level, it's also an argument for authenticity, which then increases the trustworthiness of Luke's claims in his prologue. Uh, we can look at the we sections in the Book of Acts. The historical vividness of those accounts places Luke in the vicinity of Jerusalem to be able to interview eyewitnesses. But they also demonstrate Luke's interest in historical accuracy. Well, that then corroborates the case that when Luke varies from Mark's text in historically interesting ways, that he's doing so because he has additional information available to him. And then when we see a name person and a Semitism converging on that area, it again corroborates the initial argument that patterns of name persons in Luke's text is indicative of eyewitness testimony. So that's just a couple of examples of how the case clicks together not only to be a cumulative case, but also oftentimes a corroborative evidence case. Okay, so let's look at two specific examples of how this corroborative case comes together in this clip discussing accounts involving named persons in Luke's text. Luke also seems to know a lot about Herod. He knows, for example, that Herod and Pilate actually become friends because of Jesus. And all these little details about Herod's inner circle that Matthew actually also seems to know. Now, how would Matthew and Luke know these little details about Herod? And Luke actually kind of tips his hand in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, when he mentions some of the women followers of Jesus, and he also names Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. And so he places Joanna as a witness, seeming to indicate, hey, I, I got this information from a particular source. And that explains how Luke would know something like all well, these little details about Herod. Annas and Caiaphas. Notice that he refers to them as having a single high priesthood. From a technical perspective, if Luke were getting this information from you know, some kind of official archive, this would be incorrect, because only Caiaphas was the high priest at this time. Annas used to be high priest, but he was kind of like retired. He was actually Caiaphas' father-in-law. Well, if you go to the Gospel of John, John mentions that Jesus wasn't brought to Caiaphas. Jesus was actually brought to Annas. And Annas is the one who, in the function of a high priest, interrogates Jesus, and only when Annas is done, he passes him on to Caiaphas. So even though officially only Caiaphas was high priest, both of these men 
were functioning in this way. So the fact that Luke mentions both guys is likely because his source, whether that's Joanna or John, was someone who was actually present, witnessing this political situation like a person on the ground. In these two illustrations, there were a lot of things going on at once. Passages with named persons coinciding with unique historical insight, as well as other subtle connections to other gospels like John. Few experts know the importance of an evidential case better than Dr. Lady McGrew, who's written extensively about the seemingly undesigned connections between the gospels. Two people who claim to have witnessed a bank robbery, and one of them says that the robber's shoelace was untied, and the other one, without appearing to be referring to the first person's testimony, says that he tripped when he went out. And that's a very classic undesigned coincidence, where one source narrates something that could be the cause, but does not narrate the effect, and the other source narrates what could well be the effect, but does not narrate the cause. And then because reality is internally consistent, then these fit together. And because they don't appear to be trying to refer to one another, the fact that their testimonies fit together is an indication that they are both speaking truly. What do you think is like the most important or, or compelling example of an undesigned coincidence between the Gospels of Luke and John? When Pontius Pilate is asking the religious leaders why they brought Jesus to him, and they say that he has been saying that he himself is a king, teaching seditiously against Rome. Very serious accusation. So he goes in and he asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus does not deny the charge. And Pilate goes out and says, I find no fault in this man. Very weird, because with Jesus not denying that very serious charge at all. Why does Pilate say he finds no fault in him? Well, when we go to the Gospel of John, Jesus said he was a king, but that his kingdom is not of this world and that his servants are not going to be fighting. So it's this religious and in a sense, nonviolent kingdom. And so then that explains why Pilate says, I find no fault in him. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' disciples are bickering and squabbling on the night of the Last Supper. Jesus rebukes them and he says, who is greater? The one who reclines at the table, which is how they ate in those days, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the, at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Now what's odd about that in Luke is that uh, it says Jesus was reclining at the table with them. So why does he contrast that? We don't get any answer in Luke. John makes no reference to Jesus rebuking them on that night for their quarrel, but it does narrate that Jesus took a towel and washed their feet. That's an excellent explanation for what Jesus meant by, I am among you as the one who serves. So they fit together in that puzzle-like way, which is really cool. Vandewey, like Dr. McGrew, sees a particularly fascinating connection between the Gospels of Luke and John, and in this connection, a corroboration for his argument informing the fifth tell. But before we get to that fifth tell really quick, this five-part series was made over a period of six months and was a huge effort to bring you a quality analysis of this new research into the Gospels. If you're enjoying this series and want me to be able to make more of them, please consider becoming a patron or you can also just subscribe to the channel, which I definitely appreciate. So what is the fifth tell? This fifth tell focuses on points where Luke varies from Matthew and Mark when and only when the Gospel of John is present. Okay, so let's set up this scenario. Imagine that your son, Luke, walks to school every day. Okay, you can track him with GPS. You know that he follows the same route every day with his friend, Mark. One day, However, he doesn't stop at Mark's house. Instead, he takes a detour to school. Thinking little of it, you forget to ask him about it that night when you get home from work. And for the next two weeks, he reverts to his original pattern of walking to school with Mark. Then he deviates again, skipping Mark's house, going down another street, and then heading to school. As you sort of scratch your head, you realize that these deviations from his regular route with Mark take him past his other friend, John's house. It dawns on you that your son occasionally walks to school with John. However, since John doesn't walk to school every day, 
His parents sometimes drop him off on their way to work. This explains why Luke's walking patterns seemed so sporadic. In short, the factor that influences Luke's otherwise unpredictable behavior is the presence of his friend John. Luke likes to walk to school with Mark, but he also likes to walk with John. Luke is almost religious when he relies on Mark as a written source. When only the synoptic authors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, focus on a particular text, Luke tends to agree with them. But when you incorporate John into that, and all four gospel authors talk about an event, Luke and John, when there are differences, will side together against Matthew and Mark. And this happens in very, very small details. Uh, for example, you know, to whom does um, Peter deny Jesus the second time? Matthew and Mark say explicitly it's a servant girl. Uh, John and Luke seem to possibly agree together against this. And there are one scholar counted 124 times where Luke and John agree together against Matthew and Mark. And that's five more times than the other way around. Now, it's important to mention here that when Vandewey says that they differ, he's not saying that there's like a real contradiction, but rather we're talking about minor differences, often points of like emphasis, which is expected when referencing independent testimony. And this lines up with what we learned in our last episode. Luke relies on Mark's gospel because it contains Peter's testimony, likely even interviewing Peter about a few accounts. But Luke is also aware of the beloved disciples preaching and, as Vandewey will argue, consults him as a source to clarify and corroborate Mark's account. The very places where they, Luke and John agree together against Matthew and Mark are the places where the beloved disciple is present as an eyewitness. How do you explain those two points of data? And my argument is that that is best explained by Luke's reliance on John not as a written source but as an oral source, as the beloved disciple. And he prefers his oral source, like all ancient historians did, versus his written source of Mark. And that then explains the very few times where he varies away from Mark in favor of John. But he consistently prefers information from the Gospel of John to the Gospel of Mark whenever their accounts are in tension, and then in the very places where the beloved disciple is present as an eyewitness in John's Gospel. But what best explains this data? Could it be that Luke or John merely consulted one another's gospel? Vandewey actually discusses these options in depth in his writings, but concludes that the best explanation is that Luke consulted John in person, which is the fifth and final tell. So what makes it likely that Luke the evangelist told the truth and that he drew from eyewitness sources to compose his gospel? In this series, we've looked at five historical tells. According to Vandewey, these tells not only place Luke within the proximity of living sources, but they demonstrate his likely commitment to the historian's ideal of engaging, whenever possible, with living informants. And so this is all obviously very interesting, but I think I know what many skeptical viewers might be thinking at this point. There's still a big glaring issue for many with taking Luke's account at face value. So one objection that I had in my mind as we've been going through this, and I can even see someone like writing this down in the, the comments right now is, well, can we really rely on Luke as a historical source? Luke records multiple miracles. For sources that include these types of stories, how much can we actually rely on them to give us accurate historical information? But it seems to me that you can approach the issue two ways. On one side, you can say, I know for a fact miracles cannot happen. Therefore, I'm gonna reject anything that the Gospel of Luke has to say. Or you could approach it from another way. These are This is the data in Luke's text. Uh, maybe this lends weight to miracles being possible. If you take option one, and miracles really did occur, and Luke really did recount miracle stories, you would never be able to know. If you approach the topic with an open mind and allow Luke to weigh into the discussion, I simply think that is more a more robust and and healthy way to approach the issue. Well, yes, in one sense, it's good to avoid false beliefs. And that's one thing that you can do with skepticism, is that it helps you avoid false beliefs. Like in life and in general, we don't operate in, in this way where we just avoid believing anything, right? We want to obtain true beliefs. So there's this sort of balance that I think you have to try to strike between avoiding false beliefs and then obtaining true beliefs. And that's really the, the difficult thing because some people can just go all the way to the left and just avoid mm -hmm. believing anything. But practically, that's probably not going to work. 
So you've got to figure out some sort of methodology to get you to the point where you can avoid false beliefs, but then also obtain as many true beliefs as possible. And I think that your type of scholarship, where you're giving these sorts of resources and tools to think critically and to you know evidentially weigh things, I think that can really go toward that that other approach, where it's not just avoiding false beliefs, but obtaining true beliefs. Any thoughts on that? No, I think that's spot on. And I think if you approach it evidentially like this, well, what about the miracle accounts and other ancient texts? And my honest response to that is, if someone can make a case as strong as I've made for Luke's reliance on eyewitnesses, for other miracle claims, I would be fascinated to read it because we need to have an open mind about what happened based on evidence. And I think having that balance of approaching it critically, but also being open to being persuaded, I think that's simply the best approach to these kinds of issues, which frankly, the, the Jesus issue, it's a massive issue. It's, it's a life and death issue. You know, we should be open-minded about these bigger questions as well. Because beyond all of these questions, what was it all for? Like, why go to all of this effort to write the story of Jesus? whom Luke never even met. Are there clues about Luke's driving agenda? Find out actually in our final episode. If you're enjoying this video series, make sure to check out Luke's book, The Historical Tell, or his more scholarly version of the same argument titled Living Footnotes in the Gospel of Luke. You'll find links to both of these books as well as to more information about our contributors below.